OK. Okay, we are streaming. Let me. Um... Me. All right, are we ready to go now, Jonathan? You're on, you're on mute, so I don't know if I if we are or not. Give me the thumbs up if we're ready. And we're ready to go. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to call um, this the June 22nd meeting of the Dartmouth School Committee uh, to order. Um, since the last time we met, some provisions around open meeting law have changed. Right, are we ready to go now, Jonathan? I'm hearing myself twice, so I just want That's to That's me. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to, I'm going to read a few things because I want to make sure I'm not really sure under open meeting law right now what I need to say. So I'm going to say a bunch of things and hope we cover our basis. Um, previously, we used to need to say that per Governor Baker's order suspending certain provis provisions of open meeting law, GL 30C, GL C 30A section 20, the public will not be allowed to physically access this diversity committee meeting. Members of the public can access the meeting via live stream the www.youtube.com slash DHSTV media. Um, the school committee reserves the right to implement additional remote participation procedures and will notify the public of these procedures as soon as possible. Open meeting law regulations governing remote participation remain in, in, uh, in effect, um, but we must also comply with a few provisions as the legislature has updated them. First, all votes must be taken by roll call. Um, and it says at the start of the meeting, we must announce the name of members or members who are participating remotely. Such information must also be recorded in the meeting minutes. We are all participating remotely. So I will ask Dr. Gifford to just note that all members present um, were remote in her minutes. Um, with that having been done, because we need to um, do everything via roll call, I will, thank you. I will um, do a roll call um, of all members to ensure that everyone is present. Um, I'm gonna call people who are not present so we know that they are not here. Mark Hayes. Ross Tebow. Here. Uh, Kelly Bloom. Here. Lily Chamberlain. Here. Diane Massari. Here. Julina Pampiel. Here. Jada Walker. Elizabeth Murphy. Shelly Scott. Here. Kathleen Amaral. And Shannon Jenkins, I am here. Okay. So we have two things on our main items on our agenda for this evening. Um, the first item is the approval of our minutes. Um, we'll do these separately because we'll need to roll call each of them. So I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the May 4th meeting of the Equality and Diversity Committee. Do you need a second? I need someone to move it first. I'll move it. Thank you, Shelly. All right, so Shelly moves, and can I have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Tebow. All right, now I will roll call. Mr. Tebow? Yes. Uh, Ms. Bloom? Yes, here. Uh, Lily Chamberlain? Yes. Uh, Diane Masari? Here. Uh, Julian Julian Pamphiel? Here. 
Uh, you can say yes or no, because we're doing the minutes here. Um, Shelly Scott. Yes. Uh, and then I will also vote yes. Okay. So then our second order of business will be, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of 525. That was our second meeting. Anyone move that for me? So moved. Thank you, Lily. And do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Tebow. Um, is there any discussion? I should have asked that last time. Sorry, if there's any discussion, we can go back to that. But is there any discussion on the minutes? All right, hearing none, we will roll call these minutes as well. Mr. Tebow. Yes. Uh, Ms. Bloom. Yes. Ms. Chamberlain. Yes. Uh, Ms. Masari. Yes. Uh, Ms. Pamphil. Yes. Um, Ms. Scott. Yes. And I will also vote yes. Did I get everyone? I didn't miss anyone. Okay. So that's the first item um, of, of business off of our agenda. The second item on our agenda for business today, um, we discussed at our last meeting. Um, that we would have people give us presentations to, I think it was Ms. Chamberlain made the suggestion um, to sort of educate us a little bit about um, uh, issues around native mascots. So we have joining us today, Mr. Kempton Campbell, who I believe Kempton, you're a graduate of the Dartmouth schools. Um, he now attends UConn and he is also chair of the youth commission. Um, Kempton has been doing some research um, around this issue um, as part of his work at UConn, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about um, the history um, of mascots here in Dartmouth. He's done some good research on that and some of the arguments around that. We're also joined with by Dr. Laurel Davis Delano, who is at Springfield College um, and who does research on the, uh, I believe, the psychological effects of um, and Native American mascots. Um, so she's going to talk to us a little bit about that. I've asked them to give a, to do, you know, try around 10 um, maybe 15 minutes um, presentation. Um, and then um, we will have time uh, to ask them questions. And so I believe, um, Kempton, you are going to go first. Yes. Um, so I will hand it over to you. And I think um, Jonathan has enabled you to share your screen with us. All right. Oh, it says he is disabled participant screen sharing. All right, so we'll have to hold on. We'll work on that in the first sec. Jonathan, are you still there? Captain, yes, I am. Uh, okay. You should be able to do it now. Yep. Thank you very much. All right, are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Um, so as Dr. Jenkins said, my name is Kempton Campbell. Um, I am uh, a town meeting member. I am the chair of the Dartmouth Youth Commission, and I'm a, a graduate of, of Dartmouth High School. I graduated in 2019. Um, so now I am actually a student at the University of Connecticut, where I am a double major in political science and human rights. Um, before I continue, I do want to reiterate that I am here as a student of UConn and an alumni and not as the chair of the Youth Commission. Um, so the opinions that I give here tonight are in no way indicative of the opinions of the Youth Commission. Um, with that being said, I'm here because over the spring semester of 2021, um, I participated in an independent study at the University of Connecticut with the director of Dodd Impact, um, which is a leading um, center for human rights, um, not only in the United States, but also throughout the world. Um, it's actually dedicated to Thomas J. Dodd, who was uh, one of the leading prosecutors at the Nuremberg trials, but he was also later the senator from Connecticut. Um, so with that, I studied uh, the history of Native American mascots, uh, the psychological effects behind them, um, as well as some of the arguments used in opposition to retiring Native uh, mascots. And so tonight I'm going to be um, going over some of the history that I have found, as well as the arguments that I have read extensively about throughout the semester. And I wanted to sort of leave the psychological uh, effects or impacts of Native American mascots um, to Dr. Davis Delano. Um, I think it's, she's more qualified to speak on that matter. Um, so with that being said, we'll jump right into my presentation. So 
throughout the course of my study, I focused specifically on looking at um, historical um, yearbooks from Dartmouth High School's past, um, specifically looking at them at the Southworth Library. They have a great collection um, that spans from 1922 all the way up until 2004. Um, so it gives us a very good um, timeline, and so I think this picture shows um, a rough estimate of, of when the Native mascot truly became ingrained within the Dartmouth public school community. Um, so we see that in the 1970s, um, the, the mascot really became ingrained, and that's when we first started to really um, use that, and that's, that's obviously been going on um, up until today. Now, I'm not going to go through each and every one of these pictures, but I'm going to give you a second to look at them. Um, so throughout the 30s and 40s, Dartmouth High School didn't necessarily use uh, a native mascot. They instead used the words Dartmouth on all their uniforms. It wasn't something that was necessarily um, within the public school community at the time. And then if we transition into the 50s, that's the first time that the native mascot and, and using natives for our own purposes and rallying our own purposes really became uh, a part of the high school community. Um, so in 1953, we actually had a yearbook that was themed Native Americans, where we each identified as Native people in, in order to rally our, ourselves and our community. Um, we see the Dartmouth High School students in 1958 dressed up as stereotypical Native Americans. Um, and they, that's not traditional Wampanoag um, upon against a Wampanoag wear. It's, it's, a, it's a stereotype of what it means to be Native. And then in the 1960s, it continues on. So that's when we first adopt uh, Native mascots onto our uniforms and we continue on. So we see the Dartmouth High School girls hockey team and the Dartmouth High School baseball team each adopted uh, either a symbol of, of, of Native American or the word Indian on their, their uniform. Also, the Dartmouth High School Majorettes was a big player um, throughout Dartmouth High School history. Um, they were a cheer type squad um, who would dress up in the stereotypical native wear with, with traditional headdresses, feathers, things like that. I'm going to go into more detail about them later on. And I'm not going to continue on, but through the 70s, um, that's really when it, it officially became ingrained, and that's when we continue on. Um, we see in 1974, that's actually the symbol that we use today. Um, and so that was adopted around that time period, and it's continued on till today. And then the 80s, we continue on having that, that logo and, and using the native mascots. The 90s, the same thing. 2000s, the same thing. Native uh, dress wear, the stereotypical dress wear, feathers, war paint, things like that. And then today, obviously, each of the Dartmouth High School athletic teams have adopted some sort of indication that we are um, the Dartmouth Indians, whether that's the logo or um, just the print of Indians on um, our, our uniforms. So I wanted to talk about Dartmouth High School majorettes because I think that's another big indicator of sort of the history and timeline between how um, the native theme has been ingrained within Dartmouth High School's um, history. And so one of those is through the Dartmouth High School majorettes, um, which was a um, sort of cheer squad that dressed in um, stereotypical native wear. Um, headdresses, whatnot. So that continued from 1960 around that time period up until um, the late 1990s, early 2000s. And so we see that the Native identity and, and calling ourselves Native as a way of rallying our community has been something that's been especially ingrained into our community and it's been built upon. Um, and so we still continue to use that to this day. And so now that I've gone over a little bit of the history, that's very brief, I know, um, but I wanted to give some time to talk about sort of the literature that I've read throughout the semester, um, some of the ongoing debate arguments um, in opposition to retiring Native mascots. And so throughout this, I'm going to be going over arguments that I've heard and trying to sort of um, regurgitate what I, I've, I've read and what I've learned to try to um, pass it on to, to the committee. And so the first big argument that I've heard um, is that Native American mascots, you know, they're not offensive. Um, and so with each of these arguments, I'm giving um, just a quote anonymously from a community member. Um, so this one is, there's no derogatory side to the name or the logo chosen as a sign of respect for the town's original inhabitants. So that's specific to Dartmouth. However, these arguments apply to the, the nation um, more generally when it comes to professional sporting teams. Um, 
And so some of the literature that I've read and the responses that I've read to sort of this argument is that these mascots perpetuate stereotypes of, of what it means to be native. It, it essentially boils down their identity to um, a caricature of what it really means to be native. Either that, that could be whether it means being a warrior or being a noble or, or being a savage. It really just, it, it creates a reality in which it's very hard for native people to escape the sort of stereotype that, that we've created for them. And so not only that, but these stereotypes also misinform the community, Dartmouth High School community and the Dartmouth community in general. And it leads to an environment that's more conducive to further stereotypes um, that desensitize the community members to insensitive behavior. And so an example of this is that um, Dartmouth High School, since we have adopted a native mascot, we are more likely to um, see students dressing in feathers or, or war paint or things like that because of the mascot. We, we, even if we say it's not okay and the administration says it's not okay to dress in this, it still has created that environment which it's become accessible and they, they start to do it. Um, on top of this, um, there are serious psychological consequences that I'm going to I'm going to let Dr. Davis Delano um, explain later on. Another common argument I hear is that these these mascots allow us to remember our history, um, and that when you erase history, you forget history, then you repeat history. And so that's obviously that's, that's something that I've heard a lot um, in this community specifically. Um, and so this sort of implies that mascots teach history in the first place. Um, uh, but I, I would push back and say, and a lot of people would push back and say that these mascots provide, you know, they provide no further context as to the history or the culture um, of native peoples, um, specifically indigenous ways of knowing and being within the world. Um, and it really just, it doesn't provide any context to the indigenous people within the region. So it doesn't even provide the name in that, in these instances. Um, so how can we really learn um, and remember history that isn't taught through mascots? So any history that is taught through these mascots, um, it's most likely to be history that has been reshaped and oversimplified into a, into a stereotype um, of what it means to be native. So therefore we're misinforming ourselves by relying solely on, on native mascots to educate ourselves. Another argument I hear is that these mascots honor and respect native people. And this sort of goes along with um, my last point. Um, this named logo for Dartmouth is one of honor and prestige and is worn with pride. Another one is Dartmouth stands for excellence and being proud and honoring the Indians. Um, this is another one that I've heard quite often. And I think we need to ask ourselves a few questions if we are going to rely on this argument and say that we're going to honor and respect native peoples. Um, one of these questions is like, why do communities and schools adopt mascots in the first place? Um, I would argue that we don't adopt mascots to honor the things that we are adopting them for. Um, but instead, we adopt them to use as rallying points for our community to provide a sense of belonging and purpose. Um, so, uh, for example, we have the, the Fairhaven Blue Devils. I, I don't think anybody would argue that they, we honor the Fairhaven Blue Devils. We rather use it as a means to um, rally the community. Another question that we can ask if we are going to go along with honor and respect for Native peoples that these mascots have um, is that are, are mascots the epitome of how we can honor a people? Like, are, is, that the, is that how we can go about honoring Native peoples to the best of our ability? Um, I would argue that that's not necessarily true and that if we truly want to honor Native people, we can teach an accurate uh, and historical perspective of what it means to be na uh, Native, um, whether that's teaching the culture of, of Native culture um, or if that's teaching the history of genocide and oppression of Native peoples. Um, but then also, if we go back to that lack of education surrounding um, Native peoples, we, we truly don't know um, much about Native people because of the lack of education that we have about them. And so, in a sense, how are we actually honoring and respecting Native people if we lo know very little about them? So in a way, we're actually honoring and respecting a reshaped and oversimplified and stereotypical version of what it means to be Native. Couple more, a couple more. So if we ban this mascot, what will we ban next? That's another argument that is often often cited when it comes to native mascots. Um, it's the whole idea that if we ban this, like we're gonna ban that and we're gonna ban this. So a quote that goes along with that is what will be considered politically incorrect next? 
the Fairhaven Blue Devils being anti-Christian or the Wareham Vikings being offensive to those of Scandinavian descent. And so I think that this argument, it, it, it fails to take into consideration the context to which native peoples have been used as mascots. Um, so such contexts include uh, racial discrimination, or ethnic discrimination, oppression, and genocide, um, in which native peoples have endured um, throughout the founding and expansion of this country. Um, so to compare them to the Fairhaven Blue Devils or the Wareham Vikings is to completely disregard um, that history. Additionally, um, this is something that, that um, has been cited a lot within the Dartmouth community. Um, it's, it's typically cited throughout the country as well, is um, people typically cite um, a native person and they say, so-and-so said Native American mascots are okay, so they must be okay. And I think that one is, that this, this example is probably one of the most troubling. Um, did anyone see the post from an actual Dartmouth Indian who lives locally? She said she was actually proud to, that we still use the logo. And so this is sort of problematic because it implies that one Native American's opinion can, uh, is indicative of all Native people's uh, opinions um, on the matter. And I think that that's especially troubling because they're just like you and I in that we both have um, sort of the same, we have different opinions um, on different matters. Um, but it also doesn't take into consideration the, the fact that um, these stereotypes and the subsequent psychological effects of these, these Native American mascots impact all Native peoples and not just those living within the community. So uh, what troubles me is that if we were go, to go to um, the Aponagans or Wampanoag people and gain um, some sort of uh, agreement to using the mascot, I, I think that that would still be problematic in that our uniforms have the Native mascot on it and have the words Indian on it. And so if we were to travel to other communities, it's still going to have that, that psychological impact on all Native peoples to wherever we travel. And lastly, I, this is uh, one that's very important to this committee, I think, uh, is that there are more pressing issues to attend to right now. I know that we just, um, we're coming out of COVID and we're, we have a lot to deal with right now. Um, but this is, this is something that, um, this argument is used and it, and it presupposes that Native American mascots don't have serious consequences to them. Um, so from the stereotypes and psychological consequences that I know Dr. Davis Delano will get into, um, it, it denies sort of any um, harmful consequences and it makes it so it's not a pressing issue. And I think that it absolutely is. Um, so with that, and taking into consideration those arguments that I've heard, um, I think the best argument I've heard in favor of um, keeping the native mascot is in the sake of um, tradition. Um, however, I think that all the cons vastly outweigh the pros in that. And so with that, I asked this committee, um, my policy recommendations would be to retire the Dartmouth Indian uh, once and for all, um, but it's not only enough to retire the Dartmouth Indian. Um, I think it also is required that we should develop a curriculum that teaches accurate depictions of, of Native culture and history, um, specifically taking into account Native communities um, and the founding and expansion of the United States, specifically taking into account the ethnic discrimination and genocide of Native peoples. Um, but on top of that, it's not enough to just educate um, the school community. I think it's also important to educate the Dartmouth community in general. Um, and to engage in thoughtful discussions surrounding Native American mascots and, and Native American history and culture um, in that. And so we also need to discuss the consequences um, of these mascots to foster more humane and, and just citizenship. Um, I know you have very difficult decisions um, to make as a committee, and I know that uh, people will be upset no matter which way you, you vote. And I think it's important that we educate the community or you educate the community as to why you made certain decisions. And so with that, I appreciate you letting me present here tonight. I threw a lot at you um, and I look forward to hearing your questions or, or comments. So thank you. Thank you, Captain. Just I just wanna make one point of clarification before I open it up to the committee for questions about this part, because I. I think it might be good if people want to see images or whatnot that we allow um, them to ask that now. Um, I just want to be clear that this committee, this committee does not make the decision, right, about the mascot. That power rests with the school committee. Um, but this committee can make a recommendation to the school committee about what to do. Yeah. I just want to be just just to make that clear. 
Um, so does anybody have any questions? Um, I, I just want to ask while Kempton still, Kempton, I would like you to stay around as we discuss this, but does anybody have any questions about any of the images that Kempton um, shared with us and they might like to see in further detail? I can't see if you raise your hand. So if you do have a question, just go ahead and start talking and we'll, we'll sort that out. Kempton, could you uh, stop? This is Jonathan, tech support. Uh, could you stop sharing so then uh, Dr. Jenkins could probably see people a little easier? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was just going to, I don't, it doesn't sound like anybody has questions about the images. I'll ask you um, to stay around, Kempton, um, in case we have questions later for our discussion. Perfect. Um, but for now, I'll turn it over to Dr. Davis Delano to talk to us for a while. Um, about some of her research um, and activism around this issue. Okay. Um, so I'm a white sociologist, I'm not a psychologist. And I've been studying native mascots though for over 25 years. And yet my research isn't in the piece that I'm gonna be talking about because I don't study the psychosocial effects. What I did was get together with two other scholars to produce a document that summarizes the psychological social psychological effects to aimed at educational decision makers um, because uh, we knew that it would be useful. Um, and I also study other native issues. So, um, but I'm not really talking about my own scholarship today. Um, so I'm also a member of a 12 member steering committee of the Massachusetts Mascot Coalition. And um, three of us are white like myself and um, nine of us are not and six of the native people, uh, of the nine native people represent the tribes that have the letters. Um, they were appointed by their tribes to our steering committee. Um, and they're the six tribes that has, have the letters in support of the mascot bill. Um, so um, one of the things that the steering committee does is we have been arranging some panels before school committees and I, I just wanted to, I thought, I thought Kempton did a really good job, but I wanna mention that one in a, in a recent um, visit to a school committee, some people from the school system presented native history of the area and then kind of like a slideshow like Kempton did at the beginning of the imagery. And it really upset a lot of the panelists um, because they knew some inaccuracies in the history that was being presented and they knew more about the history than the people presenting the history because they were, you know, they, they're from these tribal nations. Um, and, it, you know, I thought Kempton did a great job showing those pictures, but those can be like, you know, they can have an effect on people just seeing those images and things like um, the use of headdresses and so forth. Um, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about the findings from that we report in, in the research article um, summary that I think you all have, right? Do you have that piece? Yeah, you shared that with, the, with me earlier, and so I shared it with the committee. Okay, so I'll just kind of make it simple and do um, a summary. So the first point that we make is that educational decision makers should make decisions based on research findings and not opinions. I mean, like it wouldn't get put out, <laughs> um, you know, what, what, what way would you like us to teach reading? Let's vote about what you find the most pleasant. Um, you know, people will, educational administrators, they look at research findings and then pick, you know, what's effective. Um, and so we think that that should, you know, that general principle of following research findings should be primary rather than looking at public opinion. Um, and so here are the findings. So um, one set of studies is focused on direct effects on native students. Um, and overall, this set of findings shows that native mascots create a hostile climate um, for native youth. Um, and this includes youth um, who aren't native youth as, as uh, Kempton was mentioning, you know, there's a variety of opinions, but native youth who aren't critical of mascots, the research findings shows are more negatively affected because they don't have kind of a critical lens to, to 
um, protect themselves. Um, so um, when you expose native youth to native mascots, it decreases their self-esteem, especially uncritical native youth. Um, it reduces their capacity to imagine future accomplishments for themselves. Um, it um, also um, triggers less confidence or faith in their native communities to be able to make a difference. Um, and another finding is that um, in one study, exposure to um, the name, the logos, et cetera, um, increased negative feelings. And those negative feelings were stress, distress, depression, dysphoria, and hostility. Um, and in one study, a different study, um, the students um, tended to avoid um, athletic events when there were native mascots there. So there's a bigger, so those are the effects on native youth. There's a bigger body of research on the effects on non-native people. Um, and of course, ways that non-native people are affected, if they're affected in problematic ways, um, can indirectly be harmful to native people. So the first set of studies shows that, and the majority of non-native people in these studies are white, although not all of them are. Um, and the um, majority actually support native mascots um, and think that they honor native people. So even those folks, or especially those folks actually, um, in implicit bias tests, the research shows that the native mascots are associated with negative thoughts and negative stereotypes. Um, mo the most significant findings are that when you expose non-native people to native mascots, it increases their negative stereotyping of Native Americans. Also, if you compare non-native people who oppose native mascots to non-native people who support native mascots, um, those who support native mascots are more apt to hold stereotypical and prejudicial attitudes about Native Americans. Lastly, two studies suggest that native mascot exposure can increase discrimination um, perpetrated by non-native people against native people. So overall, um, this second set of findings, which is the effects of native mascots on non-native people, um, shows that they're actually harmful to non-native people because they're reinforcing or perpetuating or increasing uh, negative stereotypes and prejudice that can manifest in discrimination. Um, and so, and that of course, that only is not educationally sound for non-native people, um, but it's also um, can indirectly be harmful to native people. So just to put this in context, um, the findings are not surprising to scholars who study native representations because most native mascots, as kind of Kempton was alluding to, they, they're all the same. There's like, if you look at the federally recognized tribal nations, there's you know over uh, uh, close to 600 of them and they all have different cultures. And the mascots tend to be this like Hollywood version of uh, like, you know, um, pseudo native culture. Um, and kind of this kind of erases distinctions. Also, they're almost all male, which is something schools should think about, <laughs> okay? Um, the imagery. Um, and most of them are warriors or chiefs. Now you can imagine just like any um, group of people, um, there's like a huge range of occupations and tasks people do. And so like button pulling, you know, or pushing native people into a warrior chief role only is erasing huge um, aspects of people's lives. Um, they're also all kind of, nobody picks like a contemporary native soldier like from the US military, right? 
um, they pick uh, 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 um, people of the past. And one huge representational issue uh, related to native people that goes way beyond mascots is that there's very little representation in education curriculum, in media, or in other aspects of culture that are about contemporary native people who are like walking down my sidewalk, delivering my mail. Um, and um, so, um, so it's like putting people in the past um, and not recognizing what's going on today or even in the mid 1900s. Um, uh, another reason why we're not surprised is, and uh, Kempton um, alluded to this as well, that it involves non-native people, usually white people in the origin of native mascots, um, taking somebody else's identity, another group's identity, and their culture or pseudo culture, okay? Um, so representations of native mascots are representations of native American people, and yet they're created by non-native people um, and they're used by non-native people, generally speaking, um, and they're used for the purposes of those non-native people. And that's like the epitome of, you know, appropriation. Um, okay, so I, I was gonna say a little bit, um, I, I can, if you ask me later, ask, uh, talk a little bit about the attachment that a lot of people have to native mascots, which is something that I study. Um, but I wanna say a little bit about decision-making. Um, so the, one of the reasons why opinions, like it's not a good idea for schools to, uh, or towns to survey their students about this issue or survey the community. And the reason why is when that happens, it implies that non-native people should be making decisions about representations that are not them, A, and B, it ignores the research findings. Um, and so I think that's a really important thing to think about. Um, I just also want to mention that um, not only do we have six tribal nations from Massachusetts that endorse the mascot bill, um, but so does um, the National Congress of American Indians, which is the largest and most representative body um, that in, of Native Americans, period, end of conversation. Um, and they have lots of resources. And if you reach out to them, they can uh, give you some resources. Or um, can, I, can I interrupt you just one second real quick? Right. Just Committee members and anyone in the general public who might not know that. The mascot bill to which you are referring is a bill that's pending in the Massachusetts state legislature that would ban the use of native mascots statewide. I just want to make that clear. Oh, sure. Um, I thought you all knew that. Yep. It's right now it's in yeah. the so people um, may be watching live stream and they might not know that. So yeah. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Um, it's currently in the joint education committee, along with two other native bills. Um, both of which are about native education. Um, so there are also other native organizations like the Native American Journalists Association and the um, Indi um, native, um, Indian Education Association. There's academic organizations like the American, the Psychological Association, the American Anthropological Association, the American Sociological Association, which is my association. Um, and I, I want to say something, this is a little bit related to one of the points that Kempton was mentioning. Um, it's really important when you work on any Native issues, including this one, to recognize the distinction between, uh, like, like Native people, there are bodies that represent them, and those are the tribal nations, right? So the word of tribal nations is primary, right? Um, and a tribal nation might have people with a variety of opinion in it, but it's official body and it's an official body, right? That has some sovereignty. Um, and also it's important to um, distinguish between people who are enrolled in recognized native nations and people with native ancestry, or in some cases say they have native ancestry. Um, so thinking about that, and thinking about representative bodies rather than individual native people 
um, is really important. Like, is this person speaking on behalf of their tribe? Okay. Um, so I want to counter something a little bit that Kempton said. Um, one of the things that I've studied is processes of change related to mascots. And I have discovered um, that it's almost impossible to educate a community. And here's why. You can't get them there, okay? Um, and so um, in Turner's Falls, quote unquote, <laughs> around where I live, the school committee sponsored, like it was like four or five really great forums and they couldn't turn people out to these forums, okay? Um, because people didn't want to hear the information. Um, it's easier to educate a student body because you have kind of a captive audience there, um, but it's really hard to educate um, people on this issue in general. And I, I'm, you know, I'm an educator, I think we should, but I just wanna say, um, here's why it's so hard. Um, most people in, that aren't native in the US, they don't like know a little bit of native information. They know some misinformation. And so they're starting like behind, not at the starting line, but behind the starting line. And of course you have to unlearn information as you're gaining information. And that can't be done in an hour. Um, and another problem is that most non-native people in the US have very little interpersonal contact, um, especially you know, meaningful, in-depth, not little workshop thing, contact with native people to kind of counter some of this. Um, and there's huge invisibility, as I was mentioning before, of contemporary native rep representations of contemporary native people in US culture. And what exists in US culture is primarily stereotypes and primarily stereotypes of the past. And the last big barrier is that people really do believe this honors Native Americans, right? Um, and so that's what sociologists and psychologists might call a positive stereotype. And a lot of people don't understand that those beliefs are problematic. So, you know, people might say women are nurturing, but <laughs> that stereotype leads women to, to have more of a childcare load, right? Um, or, um, you know, African Americans are great athletes or Asian Americans are smart. These, if you look at their history and you look at how they operate today, these are really problematic ideas. Um, and so, but it's hard for people to kind of understand those as problematic. So um, lastly, um, it's, you know, use the research, use official representatives. Um, the, I think the best strategy, you know, education is fine, create a website or, or that kind of thing to educate your community, but don't expect a big transformation or people showing up. Um, and, um, you know, you need to, you can though, do a really good job educating the school committee and then you can have their backs. Okay. Um, and like be supportive of them and set up systems to be supportive of them. Um, if you're going to bring in a panel, there's no way, it's really difficult to arrange these panels that you could bring one in for your committee and the school committee. So you would need to bring it in for the school committee um, and, um, and they would need to be close to ready to vote for us to want to bring them in or make the effort to bring them in. Okay. So I will just, uh, to reinforce Dr. Davis Delano's uh, point about education, I believe someone texted me and said, I think we have seven people um, watching our meeting right now <laughs> in our community of uh, maybe what 30,000. And one of them was the person who texted me who was a member who could not be here, who was watching it via live stream while they're out and about. So six people are watching it who are not actually on the committee. Um, at this point in time. Although to be fair, right, it will be available. We're recording this and then we will make this available. Um, thank you for that presentation, uh, Dr. Davis Delano. Um, do members of the school committee have questions for Dr. Davis Delano or 
um, Mr. Campbell about um, what they've said this evening. Ms. Chamberlain. Dr. Dilly Davis Solano, thank you very much. And I also read your article and, and found it really helpful. Um, I have two questions. Can you talk for just another minute about positive stereotypes and why they're problematic? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, there's a variety of reasons why they're problematic. But one, one kind of obvious point is it puts everybody in a box. And they can be looked at through the lens of that box. So if we use the stereotype of Asian Americans is all smart and hardworking, okay? Um, you know, or interested in technology. That makes people think of them as a techie and not as a creative artist or as a, you know, particular type of athlete. Um, and, and then that can box their own thoughts in too, right? But what I think is problematic and people get treated based on how they're positively stereotyped. So for example, uh, at many holidays, many, not all, uh, men just, you know, let their wives do the childcare, okay? <laughs> um, because, you know, that's what they do. That's what they're perceived to be good at. Um, and then they have 11 hours of less leisure time a week. Okay. Um, but the, uh, there's also like history about why the positive stereotypes are problematic. Okay, so let me just use Native Americans and African Americans for a second. So one defense of slavery was that, um, that African Americans are, have brawn, but not brain, right? Now, a contemporary version of that is the stereotype of African Americans as athletic. And there's some research showing that um, when they're successful, it's not usually attributed to their intelligence or their hard work because they're seen as natural. So there, it gets to, it, it's rooted in historical oppression and then it can manifest negatively today. If we look at native mascots, okay, let me, I didn't talk about this. So um, in general, mascots get, get picked because they're aggressive, violent, powerful, those sorts of things. So, and most of the mascots are animals, except for Native Americans, um, and they don't pick deer and rabbits, right? Um, people pick like um, aggressive types of animals like tigers or, or, or whatever. So one of the main forms of justifying genocide was what scholars call the bloodthirsty savage stereotype, that Native Americans were horrific, aggressive warriors and they were the ones that were perpetrating violence and therefore that justified uh, violence against them and shoving them to other parts of the country and onto reservations and so forth. Like that's, it's that stereotype which is what gave rise to the selection of native mascots, which was happening um, at, like during a time when, like when they first rose up, you know, white people didn't think native people were really cool. Okay, ecological whatevers. Um, and so like right now that's perceived as positive, like brave, fighting, strong warrior, but it was previously used you know, in another way, right? In a negative way. Um, and so, um, so positive stereotypes often have really oppressive roots and they often operate in ways that are extremely problematic today. So for going back to the Asian American one, um, you know, the stereotype is that they're really hardworking and dedicated students but that also leads people to believe that they're not socially interesting. And so people then make less so social connections and think they're less fun and don't invite them to do things. So that was a long answer, but. 
That was just really interesting. Thank you very much. And I just have one more question because I did look at your article and I can't say that I read every single article that was linked to it, but I, I read many of them. And, and I honestly didn't see any article that showed any positive impact from a Native American mascot. Is that because there wasn't any article like that? Or was that because you were just looking for ones that were no, negative? There, there are no, um, I'm trying to say, right? no <laughs> findings about positive effects, uh, you know, in general. Thank you. I, I thought that was the answer, but I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> I think I want to add on to that throughout the course of my semester. I, I've read about three dozen um, different articles on this topic, and I've never encountered a single one that talks about any positive impacts that Native American mascots have had on a population. Um, can, I ask a follow -up, can I ask a follow-up question to that one? Um, uh, I wonder if anyone's ever researched, right, we've examined sort of the effect of uh, Native mascots. It increases negative stereotyping among non-Native populations. Does that negative stereotyping extend beyond just Native Americans? In other words, oh, okay. do those implicit biases carry over to other racial and ethnic groups? I'm not there is only one study that has studied this, okay. and we're all baffled about the finding. So in this one study, they exposed people to um, non-Native non -native people to Native mascots and it increased their stereotyping of Asian Americans. Okay. I mean, the stereotypes of Asian Americans and the, they're not the same as the stereotypes. They're not parallel uh, of Native Americans. Um, but, you know, I don't know, like the best that people can do is kind of like, maybe this is generates more simplistic thinking Okay, do other committee members have, thank you, have other, have questions, comments? I just wanna say thank you very much to Kempton and Dr. Okay. Davis Delano for your presentations. That was really informative and uh, we appreciate your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Ms. Scott, you have a question? Um, I think Kelly and I are on the same page. I just wanted to thank you. It was very helpful uh, to get perspective from both of you. I took a lot of pages of notes because it, I think it's really helpful um, as things come up in conversation um, and as we're trying to do work to help people understand the issue. So thank you. Mr. Tebow. I would just like to echo that and thank both Dr. Davis Delano and especially Kempton. Um, you know, Kempton having graduated just two years ago. Uh, it's always nice to see a Dartmouth High School graduate come back and, and contribute to the community. Um, and so Kempton, thank you for that. I, uh, I thought you did a very nice job. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I would also like, Kempton, would you be willing to share with us um, your, you can email that to me, your final presentation. Um, I would like to make that available as a public document. I think in particular, some of the the historical pictures are, are really useful, right? I mean, one of the arguments in the community has been that this is a tradition, but- It's not always been that way. Not, right? I mean, if you, it, it's a, if you go back a certain time, it was present and not present and then present, right? And so I think that's really uh, important and those pictures help illustrate um, that, that story, right? Uh I know there are pictures that I didn't add to the presentation that I think the community members might be interested in. Um, okay. But then, uh, honestly, they're all available at the Southworth Library. Um, you can go yeah. and you can look at it. So Dr. Davis Delano's point, though, right? If, I mean, it's hard to educate people. It's Absolutely, yeah. Harder as an educator, I know, to get them to go to the library. Um, to the extent that we're trying to collect these resources, if you would like to share them with me, I will also make those sort of publicly available so, so that people um, can see them. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? So I'd like to just maybe sort of talk about and give you guys, a, we've had, I think there's been a lot of food for thought here tonight. And I don't, I think, I don't know, I don't wanna speak for the committee, but myself, I think I want some time to maybe think about and process a little bit before we come up with a, 
a plan. I might think we might talk about some possible plans that we could then all think of and that in the next meeting, have some discussion of all of this and talk about what our next steps might be. Um, while we were while we were listening, I was thinking about some possible ways that we can proceed. Um, first, we could, I will give a sort of a very brief um, update to the school committee on Monday night about what we, uh, what we heard here tonight, very brief, um, but we could um, file an interim, interim report with the school committee, sort of summarizing some of the things we learned, sharing that documentation with them. Um, that's one option. Two, um, we could come together as a committee and make a vote on what we as a committee might want to recommend. Maybe people know enough. And then again, I'm putting these all out as possible um, scenarios for us to consider. Um, the third thing to consider is uh, whether we want to continue to have more sessions, um, whether we want to have um, community input. Um, we've heard um, some arguments against that today, right? Um, uh, also, um, we could talk about potentially scheduling a session with um, Native American panelists, but I think we, to Dr. Davis Delano's uh, uh, point, um, that would be need to be with the full school committee. So these are all a range of options that we can consider. I don't think we want to make a decision tonight. Does that seem fair to say? But how we want to proceed, we would at our next meeting have a discussion about what our next plan of attack is. So that having been said, my question for the committee now is, are there any other sort of possible next steps that you think we might want to consider or discuss at our next meeting? I was just sort of coming up with ideas as we move forward, and so there may be other things. Ms. Amphiel, I think, and then Mr. Thibault, go ahead. Um, maybe in the next meeting, we can talk about how we're going to educate students about Native American, because I feel like in our school education, we are, we never talk about the history of Native Americans, really, or at all. So maybe bringing that into our curricular, or like thinking about how we're going to do that as well. Can I so say I a couple things about what other schools have done? So, sure, and then I'll come back around to it. Go ahead, Laurel. Okay, so um, one, you know, we've been doing panels and they usually get recorded. And one thing that um, one school system did was they shortened up a, the panel and they showed it to um, the student body. And then um, students wrote questions that were screened to two of the panelists who came back to the school so that they could answer the questions that the students um, or the legitimate questions that the students had. Um, the other thing I was just gonna mention is if you know um, which tribal nation or nations are nearby, um, we might be able to connect you to a single or two speakers um, if you wanna like bring that to, you know, uh, I don't know whose traditional lands you're on. I think, it, I think we're the Pocasset Wampanoa, I think is the, is the current uh, tribal nation. Shelly, you're raising, shaking your head yes. Does that sound right to you? I, I know because you- It does sound right. I'm not a hundred percent, but yeah. And Herring Pond might be nearby, Wampanoag. So both, we have tribal reps from both of those um, tribes on our steering committee. Okay. And they both have letters. So I also want to point out, Mr. Chief, I know you had something to add, um, just sort of also in response to Ms. Panfield's comment. I agree with you, but I would also say that I, I think those might be, they're related but separate issues, right? Because whether or, not, whether or not we keep the mascot is one question, right? But how we do education around Native American and our tribal neighbors is a, is a question that we wanna consider regardless of that decision, right? If we decide to keep it, we should ask that. If we decide to get rid of the mascot, we should ask that, right? It is a question that I think this committee can look into. Um, and so I think it's a good one to keep on our list of things that we need to talk about, right? There's lots of them. We've got a running list. 
Um, but I, so they're like related, but distinct. Does that make sense? Right. Mr. Tebow, were you going to um, add a suggestion or a comment? I, I was, but I, I kind of lost it. <laughs> um, okay. I, I forgot what I was going to say. So, uh, did, but do I understand that what you're suggesting is that we, we discuss next steps for the next meeting? Is that? I think that, I, I think that perhaps we, I guess my sense is personally, and I'm, I don't know if the committee is saying this, I have a lot to think about. And I'm not sure what the next right step is, right? I want to read more and think about it. So and that's what I was going to speak to. Um, okay. You know, Kempton, in Kempton's, um, you know, I, I, it's a very complicated issue. I get that. But to me, Kempton made, made the point about what, do, what is a mascot supposed to stand for? It's supposed to be a rallying um, point for a community. And obviously the psychological impact that it has a native um, people or non-native people, you know, regardless, it just seems to me that if you have a mascot that's this divisive, then how can it ever truly achieve the purpose of a mascot to begin with, which is to rally a school. Um, and I, I just, you know, the rest of all of the other points are very important and worthy of discussion. I just think that um, at its simplest form, I just don't know how we how keeping it is a real consideration. Um, so that's you know. I will also say, Mr. Tebow, that's why I said one of like option two is we may at our next meeting say, look, this is what we've learned and we're ready to make a recommendation to the school committee on this issue. We may be ready to take that step that you're talking about. I'm not sure we're ready to do it right now, but I want to I think we should put that on the table for our next meeting that maybe we need to do more and take more steps, but maybe we don't, right? Maybe we're ready to have a vote and make a decision and do a, a sort of a full report on this issue to the school committee. Um, again, I, I'm not sure we want to do that tonight, right? Um, but I think if we maybe thought about that over the next couple of weeks, that's something we should discuss at our next meeting. Does that make sense? Uh, another point is that if you wanted to have contact with um, Native representative voices, your group, not the school committee, could watch one of the recorded panels from one of the other towns. I did. I did share those recordings with the um, with the committee, so that that is that is available, and we can share that with the community as well. Um, it just seems to me that I think. We all probably have a lot to think about, and maybe at our next meeting, the plan is the item on our agenda, well, two, approve minutes from this meeting, but then figure out what our next step is. Does that seem about right for everyone? I see a lot of shaking of heads, yes. Okay, so then the big question is, when would our next meeting be? We haven't scheduled the next meeting. Tuesdays seem to work okay for everyone, yes. And I think we'd be looking in July. I know it's summer and I'm asking a lot of you, I'm sorry, but um, let me, I'm trying to look at my calendar. Um, July 13th, that's a Tuesday. Would that work for people? Luckily, we can be remote. So if some of you are away in fabulous places like Ms. Chamberlain, I know you don't have to, but you can always dedicate a committee members zoom in um, from whatever fabulous place you might, uh, might be at. But how about we tentatively schedule our next meeting for Tuesday, July 13th at 6.30. And we'll, so far right now, our items in the agenda will be to approve the minutes from this meeting and we'll talk about what we as a committee want to do next. Does that make sense for everyone? I see lots of nodding heads. So I just want to end by saying, I want to say thank you to Jonathan Galishaw for arranging um, the tech on our meeting tonight. Thank you to Dr. Gifford for attending and taking um, the fabulous minutes. Um, thank you also to Dr. Davis Delano and Mr. Campbell for uh, presenting to us. Um, I think we all learned a lot um, and it was 
um, good to hear from both of you this evening. And so we appreciate you taking the time um, to join us. You're welcome. Thanks for educating yourselves. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Tebow. Can I have a second, please? Second. Uh, Ms. Masari. All right. Thank you. All right. And now I get a roll call. And um, Dr. Gifford, before as I roll call out, I just want to note that Ms. Murphy joined us. Um, I, if we can indicate that on the notes. So, all right. On the motion to adjourn, Mr. Tebow. Yes. Uh, Ms. Bloom. Yes. Ms. Chamberlain. Yes. Ms. Masari. Yes. Uh, Ms. Pamphil. Selena, yes, okay. Uh, Ms. Murphy. Yes. Uh, Ms. Scott. Yes. And I also vote yes. Thank you everyone for um, your time this evening. Um, for spending time in your summers um, to, to join us. And I look forward to seeing you all on the 13th. Good night.